All right. Hmm. <clears throat> All right, to everyone who just joined us, uh, thank you for your patience for hanging out there for a minute or two while we uh, were working through a little technology issue. I believe we are now streaming live on Facebook. Yes, we are. Excellent. Um, well, I want to just uh, thank everyone for being here. My name is Mike Cross Barnett. I'm the manager of neighborhood programs for Strong City Baltimore. And this is Strong City's first uh, neighborhood conversation. It's a new program we're launching. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. But first, we're going to have some welcoming remarks from Strong City uh, interim CEO, Reggie Davis. Reggie, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll be uh, I'd like to welcome everyone here to the first of our neighborhood conversations. Today we are doing what Strong City has done for 51 years, supporting neighborhood leaders who are working to make their communities stronger. Um, how, we, how we do that may, have, may look a little different today, but our purpose has never changed. The leaders you're about to meet represent the best about Baltimore. All of them give tirely to their day after day and year after year. Why do they do it? It's not for fame or recognition. They are mostly unknown outside of their own neighborhood. It's not for status or privilege, and it's certainly not for money. They do it because for one single reason, because they love Baltimore and they want to make it better. That's why they're here today. It's why we're here, and most likely, it's why you're here too. Thank you for sharing this opportunity for growth and learning with us because in the end, there is nothing more important. Have a great session. <clears throat> Thank you, Reggie. And, and again, uh, welcome to everyone um, who's joining us today, both in the Zoom uh, chat with us and, and also uh, people out in, in Facebook world. Um, so as I said a moment ago, we are, um, we're, we're doing a new program, something we haven't tried before, uh, and we're calling it Neighborhood Conversations. And what, what, what we're really doing here is we're trying to continue in the spirit of Neighborhood Institute. As some of you probably know, Neighborhood Institute is Strong City's annual event where we bring together about 300 neighborhood leaders from all over Baltimore. Uh, we have dozens of workshops. We talk about sharing ideas and solutions for Baltimore's challenges. Uh, it's always a wonderful event. And this year, of course, we weren't able to have that. Uh, and you know, we were, we were all kind of sad about that, but then we, we thought to ourselves, well, what can we do? What can we do um, that still honors that spirit of, of Neighborhood Institute? So the first thing I'd like to do is, is thank um, some of the folks who have you know, been uh, supportive of Neighborhood Institute, uh, some of our sponsors who have been, been with us. Uh, and even though we weren't able to have the event this year, we still wanna acknowledge uh, their very critical support. So thank you very much to Baltimore Community Foundation, T. Rowe Price Foundation, Loyola University, Maryland, Thomas Wise of University of Maryland, Baltimore, LifeBridge Health, Falkenhams Hardware, Cohen and Dwin Law Firm, Charm City Run and Thread. Uh, I know you wanna get to know our panelists uh, and, and start this conversation. And so um, I'm gonna just uh, introduce them to you for a moment and then we can, can get right into it. So um, yeah, no particular order here, but I wanna, <clears throat> start us off by introducing Sandy McFadden. Um, so Sandy is a mid Govins resident. She's a longtime community and education leader who's worked for years as an organizer on the York Road Corridor and has held leadership positions in the mid Govins Community Association and the York Road Partnership. Sandy currently is a treasured member of the Strong City family as our community school coordinator at Govins Elementary School where she works on developing community-based partnerships, cultivating volunteers and tutors and mentors, 
and creates parent engagement programs that build leadership and focus on academic success, services, and youth and community development. So uh, welcome to Sandy. Um, we also have with us Ashley Esposito today, co-founder of Village of Violetville. Um, that's an organization that she started in, uh, in her home in Southwest Baltimore. Ashley calls this organization that focuses on boosting morale, finding creative ways to make space for community involvement and building strong relationships between residents, businesses, elected officials, and collaborating with surrounding communities. Village of Violetville uses data to drive solutions, working together to give everyone a voice as they fix issues. Ash Ashley also works in tech and assists in social media outreach with various groups. We also have with us uh, Ariana Kudunas, who's a built environment professional with expertise in open space design, transportation planning, and making communities more livable for young and elderly residents alike. In August 2019, Ariane began the monthly Utah Place Play Days in an effort to foster joy and unity between Baltimore's historically divided neighborhoods to the west and east of Utah Place in central west Baltimore. Since the COVID-19 outbreak, Ariana has become a repository of information for her community regarding COVID-related resources, civic engagement opportunities, and neighborhood beautification efforts. And we also have with us Lucia Islas, a resident of Highland Town and president of the first and only Spanish-speaking community organization in Baltimore, Comité Latino de Baltimore. Lucia is a longtime member and current leader of Mis Raices, the first Latino parent group at a school in Baltimore. She owns a cleaning company and has also been working since June as outreach specialist at Centro Sol, which offers support, mentoring, health services, and more for the Latino community. And I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for today's session, Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement at the JHU Bloomberg School, a distinguished leader on public health issues in Baltimore and nationally. Josh, a Mount Washington resident and a Baltimorean through and through, previously served Baltimore City as its health commissioner. After Barack Obama's election in 2008, he led the Obama transition team for the US Food and Drug Administration and President Obama then named him Principal Deputy Commissioner of the FDA. Following his stay in Washington, Josh served as Secretary of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, it's great to have uh, this panel with us it's, it's wonderful to have all of you uh, in the room here with us. And with that, I want to turn it over to Josh Sharfstein uh, to, get, to get this conversation started. Josh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, um, Mike. And thanks to uh, Strong City Baltimore for hosting this great conversation. I'm so excited um, because I know um, how great the people that we'll be hearing from are. You know, the, the COVID pandemic has impacts at every level. It is affecting the entire economy. It's infecting uh, individuals and affecting their families, uh, often in very tragic ways. And it also has impacts on communities. So we're gonna talk about those impacts and um, in Baltimore and what community organizations are doing about them. I'm gonna start by asking for some initial uh, comments from each of the neighborhood leaders to tell us uh, a little bit about their community and when um, they knew that the pandemic would be um, a big challenge at the community level. And maybe I'll start with you uh, first, uh, Sandy. I think you need to unmute though first. Thank you, Dr. Josh. And good afternoon to everybody. Um, the York Road Partnership or the York Road Corridor is kind of a residential spine that um, connects more than 20, um, 20 communities along the York Road uh, corridor. The York Road, had, York Road has been uh, a dividing line for race and for class for many, many years. Uh, to its west, uh, west side of York Road, um, they're largely white 
communities that are some of the wealthiest in Baltimore City, uh, and they are Guilford and Homeland. And to the east of York Road is a mix of African American working class neighborhoods with some pockets of poverty. According to a book which was just recently published by Strong City called Building Blocks, um, we, we have many descriptions about the activity on the demographic of the York Road corridor. These are stories, neighborhood stories, and York Road is one of them, uh, which talks about neighborhood transformation. I really would recommend to everybody to get a copy of it. I'm sure that'll make Mike very happy. He is the chief editor of uh, this incredible um, book. So my, spe my specific community is Midgovens, and it is one of those 20 neighborhoods located on the corridor. Um, I am vice president of the Midgovens Community Association, and I, I um, have lived in Midgovens since 1994. And since I have been in this neighborhood, I have never known the community association to be non-functional and not strong. Um, <clears throat> we meet monthly um, at the DeWeese Recreation Center um, the last Monday of every month, if there are any people who might be interested. Um, when COVID-19 was announced and there was a statewide shutdown called by the governor, there, there was a grave concern, I think, on the part of our community association and all of the local associations and organizations, um, including our politicians and our universities, because York Road is, is filled with many, many wonderful um, assets there, there are a, just an incredible number. <clears throat> there are three major universities um, and there are a number of schools, my school, Govins Elementary being one of them, but Tunbridge Charter School is also a part of that, Walter P. Carter, Guilford Elementary, all of these organizations, I think, um, had major concerns about what was going to happen when there was the, uh, the, the big shutdown. Um, one call came to me uh, almost immediately after we heard that we needed to be quarantined in our homes from a senior who was um, still working but uh, lost her so source of income. She was totally frantic because her uh, the, the job that she was working closed its doors for an undetermined um, amount of time. She had no idea when she was going to go back to work. Um, another case were um, some parents who were, um, were part of our school who gave us a call. They too, um, pretty, pretty frantic because they were now unemployed and didn't know where food was coming from uh, to feed their their families, they didn't know how bills were going to get paid, how the rent was going to be paid, um, how children, how their kids would even get assignments from school because um, they didn't have any devices. So all of these things really represented a um, tremendous pressure upon the communities. And I'm going to leave it at that, Dr. Sharfstein, and uh, turn it over to whoever else might want That's to share great. a little bit about their community. Great, well, please call me Josh. And that was just a perfect uh, start for this to really explain um, the Midgovans community, the important role of the community association and how naturally because of that important role, people turn to it in this, in yes. this moment of crisis. Absolutely. I think I'll, I'll go next to Ashley and maybe talk a little bit about the experience in Violetville. Hello, so basically, uh, as Mike mentioned before, like our whole purpose is to focus on morale and the well being of uh, our residents. So it really kind of COVID happening kind of put our whole model to the test. And also because we have like an older population, um, we have multi generational households. I was actually pregnant during this whole thing and I just had a baby in July. So that was like a little bit crazy. So <laughs> thank you. 
Yeah, so my concern was just making sure that we had information available and resources and kind of filling the gaps where where we needed to. So if somebody suggested something that would boost morale, then we would try to make it happen. Um, and then I did know that a, a lot of our community are essential workers. So yeah, it, it was just a lot. Yeah. And then also we're a very social community. So as far as the social distancing, that was another concern because we are like, like, for example, my block, we're like family, like people are in each other's houses and stuff. So that's been really difficult. So when did you know, what were the first signs that this would be an issue for your association, not just hitting people individually, but really something that Violetville had to kind of come together around? Yeah, I knew people would contact us and ask us, um, like, if we knew how to get certain things or um, if we knew of any jobs available that happened. Um, yeah, so it's mostly been that. And then we, we're also coordinating with the city agencies. So if they had resources, uh, making sure that we set up the events and we distributed it amongst like, like uh, among all of our social media platforms and word of mouth. All right. Thank you. I'll turn next to Lucia um, to, to tell us a little bit about the absolutely critical work uh, she has been doing in one of the neighborhoods with quite, quite a large number of COVID cases. Yes, hi, hi everyone. Like you just say, my name is Lucia Islas. I'm the president of the Comité Latino de Baltimore. And as, as everybody knows, this is the first community organization that is um, in the area of Highland Town. Uh, we've been working very hard since three years ago, and most of our community has more than three or five kids. So it's very, very um, difficult to get resources from anywhere because of the pandemic, they couldn't go outside, right? So we start getting calls and calls saying that they didn't have a device for the school, they didn't have food. Many of the, our people, they don't, work, they don't drive. So it was very difficult. Also, when they start uh, calling me, they were like, Wait, what should I do? Uh, where can I get some people that can translate for me, even for the medic, even for the hospital? So we decide, we decide to talk huh? to uh, another people, and That's not a big one. Oh. what we did is that we talked to Andy from Southeast CDC, we talked to Gallery yeah. Church, we talked to Sid Cohen, and also we talked to Monica Guerrero from Centro Sol. So we together get something that we call a uh, united community with it, Comunidad Unida. And with this, uh, and together obviously with the city, we bring food for the people. So we start distributing food every Saturday. This is our 22 second week that we are giving food to the Latin community. Obviously we have volunteers and everybody drives the food to their homes. So everybody's happy. Why? Because we are keeping our social distancing from everyone, everyone and we don't want nobody to come outside. So that's what uh, Comité Latino de Baltimore is doing for the, the people. Also we are having meetings with uh, politicians about how they can get devices or how they can get even uh, a, a financial assistance, uh, the, the, the food stamps, many things, because many of our people, they get, they get nothing and they don't have work. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and thanks so much for, for that description. I mean, it's a pretty intense situation that you are describing with people needing help because they're sick. At the same time, some are unemployed many people don't have food. So you're really on the front lines of the COVID response in Southeast. Um, I wanna to turn to Ariana and before I do, I'll just mention with respect to um, Utah Place, uh, that, that road has a little, at least 
according to um, my family, a role in, in my own history because apparently my grandfather, when he moved, his family moved from uh, Europe to the United States, they settled on one side of the street, which was the white side, you know, that there was a rigid segregation right along that road. Mm -hmm. But he learned English from the other side because his parents never spoke English. Mm -hmm. So it, that, that, that uh, has a special place, at least in our family's history. But tell us about what, what has been going on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for sharing that family history. So um, how I started to really get involved in my community, which is Madison Park, was through the play days that um, Mike mentioned. And that is, um, I, I look back at an op-ed I wrote in the sun last summer uh, with tips on how to create your own play day. And it should have a biohazard warning on it now because it's everything that is anti-COVID, you know, paint a child's face, share sidewalk chalk, share lemonade, share snacks. So I really, I, I feel kind of similar to Ashley, even though I think we do pretty different things, but the recalibration of having to go from being very much physically in people's space and sharing space being so much about um, what the service was that those gatherings were providing every month and um, really recalibrating to a digital platform, at least for now, as a vehicle for sharing information, both you know the, the real necessities, like I always start emails with, here's where you can get testing, here's where you can get food, here's where you can get a computer, things like that. And then having a lot of um, information about positive things that are happening that people can draw a connection to. So if there's community cleanup that's happened, before and after pictures of what was a trash filled alley and what is no longer. Um, and I mentioned that not to jump too much into what I've done, but, or what our community has done in response, because I know we'll get to that later, but just to kind of give that context. And the, the population I'm interacting with is both my community of Madison Park and Points West. And then to speak to that red line divide, which we very much still see the legacy of today with Utah Place, to points east, you have the community of Bolton Hill full of many people who, who are ready and willing to give resources uh, to help those who are in need. So kind of being at the intersection of those populations of those who want to know where to donate, who want to know how to help out, and those who need to know the resources that are available to them. Um, and I, I think to the point of your question of how did you know when, you know, we've got a couple of schools directly in our neighborhood or adjacent to it. We have a rec center, we have transit um, services that run along Utah Place and most of our residents are frontline workers. So just drawing the connections of as soon as the school shut down, as soon as the rec center was closed, as soon as there was caution tape around the swing sets and uh, transit service was drastically reduced, just knowing that there was going to be a huge impact um, to the, our residents. Thank you. Well, we're really getting a sense of how much um, things had to change quickly, you know, it, it, during this pandemic and how a lot of the pressure for that was apparent to the community associations and you really had to respond. And so I wanna just ask each of the panelists to talk about maybe the one or two things that you think were the most important that your community association has been involved in, in terms of responding, you know, to the direct disruptions uh, caused by the pandemic. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll start again with you, Sandy. Um, but um, you should uh, unmute. Okay. Well, <clears throat> Midgovins has over 2,300 people in its, in its community. And our community is attached to the larger community called Greater Govins with an overall population of over 13,000 people. Our community association by itself could not respond to the challenges of the pandemic without uh, real partnerships and networking and the support of not only our neighbors, uh, but organizations, uh, churches, uh, leaders, city government. Um, we, we were able to, to pull together all of those resources. And I want to um, just really personally thank 
uh, a number of our politicians in our district in fourth district and 43rd uh, legislative district as well. Um, Bill Henry, our city councilman in the fourth district uh, and his legislative liaisons, uh, Casey Kelleher and uh, Nia Govain, um, almost immediately created a local response team that met each week during the beginning of this pandemic so that we could keep the community informed uh, through their leaders and through social media, through weekly updates um, on city resources. And those updates um, identified feeding sites, food giveaways, non-perishable food uh, for our homeless population in our community, um, breakfast and lunch, grab and go bags. Um, they informed us that that group of that response team was amazing uh, to, to really bring resources to our community that um, we wouldn't have known unless that was created. The one thing that I think I learned during all of this time um, is that there is a huge network of behind the scenes operations in our various communities. Um, there are workers and volunteers that made this response to COVID just a little bit more bearable. So um, I really wanna to give a shout out to them. There were mutual aid networks that popped up in our neighborhoods where we were helping each other even across neighborhoods. So it, it was an incredible uh, opportunity for um, the the saying that people the people were saying throughout the, the pandemic we are in this all together and and i really found that to be true great so, I'll thank you there. Mm -hmm. thank you I, I think what that illustrates is the community association is connected on the one hand to yes. the city to the city's resources to, to mm -hmm. great elected leaders and on the other hand you're able to turn around and touch so many people mm -hmm. you know in their homes so you're really a critical connection. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, I'll see whether uh, any of the other panelists wanna jump in or I'm happy to call on you, but if, if you're inspired, feel free. Hi. Ashley, go Ashley. ahead. <laughs> yeah, I have to agree. Like, uh, like the city agencies definitely responded quickly. And um, the one thing that I saw in Violetville is the residents really banded together. So for example, like um, one family, they got together and they made these laminated, um, these laminated different color sheets to give to the elderly family or the elderly household. So that like, if there was a green one in the window, then we knew they were fine. If they switched it to red, then they needed help, whether that be like groceries or things like that. And then we also had a big response. Um, we had a lot of people sign up to volunteer to help and check in on people. So. Yeah, so I'd have to say like the agencies and then definitely the residents mm -hmm. were our most, like our best resources. Yeah. Great, Lucia? Yes, I can also say that um, obviously, uh, like you say, uh, everyone gave us help, but I can say that because my community in the area 21 to 24 was the most affected because of the COVID-19, we got huge help from Central Sol. They provide the testing COVID-19. So very fast, they, they provide all this testing. And also uh, Mima, Tiki Cohen, we, we, we got many calls from everyone. So everyone help us. And I always say this, and I always repeat this, but for me as a woman, as a Latin woman, it's so nice to know that everybody is taking care of us. So I think we can see that everybody loves Latin community. It's not like sometimes you can hear racism or things like that. No, the pandemic made us that we are really loved from this city, which is so I'm so happy. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Ariana, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, kind of the overarching answer I had to this question was coordinating services. And then within that, you know, there's testing. I would say if we had to pick one, that was the really important thing, especially given how many of our residents are frontline workers. So um, the University of Maryland Medical Center in coordination with Brown Memorial Church, our neighborhood association and several other entities um, coordinated to make that happen right in the heart of our community. And we really saw a lot of um, that being just really crucial and really helpful. And, you know, there's the food distribution piece, um, civic engagement piece, seeing how um, the No Boundaries Coalition, which our neighborhood is included in, did a lot around both census outreach and get out the vote during the primary. So instead of their typical kind of gatherings they would have, like we saw with a lot of um, celebrations or, or getting out the word on something um, this spring and summer, we did a big vote parade around West Baltimore. So um, just seeing how those different responses that were COVID uh, specific were really important. And the other thing I would say is the overall or organizing around sharing both current existing services and how to re respond in a coordinated effort and a timely effort. And also what I'm now seeing in the last couple months is a lot of these groups that, um, I forget who said it, I think it was Sandy, that there's just so much civic work happening behind the scenes that it's like now a lot of these institutions and individuals are getting better coordinated. And I like to think of it as this term we keep hearing of building back better, uh, especially at the intersection of the conversations around anti-racism right now is getting these groups to talk about how are we creating institutional, you know, infrastructure-based uh, systemic change as well. Um, yeah. Great. Well, those are all really great comments. You know, it. I'm going to just say something really briefly from the national perspective. When this all started, a lot of people called me and said, "Well, we can really expect a massive catastrophe in Baltimore." Now, certainly it's been very, very difficult for Baltimore and there are way too many people who've lost their lives and the consequences for many families are incredibly severe. But if you look at Baltimore compared to other places, uh, Baltimore has not actually done so badly. Um, if you compare to a number of other cities that have been at times, you know, totally in, in uh, total crisis from the coronavirus, Baltimore has done relatively well. And I think one of the reasons for that was just um, made obvious by the, the discussions of how um, communities uh, mobilized, how the, the government did a lot of important things and then partnered with so many different organizations to uh, help close um, gaps and get critical information to people in the city. Um, I want to turn next to uh, the question of mental health. This has been a very, very stressful period. We have kids who can't go to school, parents who can't go to work. Um, the normal ways of interacting have been disrupted. And um, people, you know, as, as you all have been talking about, a lot of what community associations do is bring people together and that, that makes them happy. It helps people um, feel a part of something. How, how did all of you um, see the role of your association uh, with respect to mental health, as opposed to the kind of core um, services requirements that we were just talking about. Maybe I'll start with you this time, Ashley. Hi. Well, I'd say probably like one of the little things that we do is like a mental Monday. So we post like a positive quote on our social medias, like just as a reminder to be like kind to yourself. And then our neighborhood also does uh, kindness rocks. So they like hide little rocks with messages and stuff for each other. Um, and then we so have- So what, what, what's a message on a kindness rock? I've never heard um, of that before. I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, like one will just say, actually, I have one. Well, I, I don't want to grab it right now, but- Hey, grab yeah, it, like, grab it, like, grab it. Oh. If you have, yeah, grab it, I'd say. Uh, if you don't have it, that's okay. But. Yeah, because someone made me a kindness rock for the baby. So <laughs> it has like little blocks and things and it said, welcome, okay. Vincenzo and stuff like that. Yeah, so they do those. It's usually kids that do that. And then we've been able to do cleanups. Um, and this Sunday, we're doing yoga at our park. Uh, one of our neighbors decided to do like a little free session. And then we also have a neighbor that's been doing uh, yard concerts. He's been playing like Peruvian music. 
Ooh. Yeah. So it's like little things can really boost morale and like, like help deal with the mental health issue. Great. Sandy, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I just wanted to share one, one thing that I thought was just wonderful. Um, Mid Govins has a beautiful 14 acre park in the middle of our community. Uh, it's right off of York Road and many people don't even know it exists, but we, um, and so one of our local churches, um, Front Porch Church, which really has been developed to serve the, the community of, of the York Road Carter, um, Pastor Andy McNeely, um, we, we have not, we had not been able as, uh, as a church community to connect with our larger community. So um, last Sunday, uh, the church asked permission from Reckon Parks and from our community association to have a service, a face-to-face -face service. Um, we, were, um, we were socially distanced, we had masks on, but it was a wonderful time because nobody had seen anybody since March. So it was a wonderful time of kind of celebration and just laughing and, and, and kind of just talking and sharing. Um, and I think that uh, that, was, that was something I think that would help all of, it really helped all of our mental health. Uh, it was a wonderful activity. And um, I'm hoping that people will get a chance to use our public spaces in uh, those kinds of ways a little bit more during this time because they certainly are available. And which Ashley just kind of mentioned about some of the activities they did. That's great. I'll mention one for my community, Beechtree Place in Mount Washington. Um, our community association president had an art show for her five-year-old daughter. So they uh, wow. outside and they put up her various works of art and um, Everybody came around socially distanced, wearing masks, and she was standing there just beaming uh, with pride. And they even did like a little flyer that explained what the different artwork meant. And it was really, uh, really touching. And so many people came out, I think, because, you know, it's been such a such a difficult time for everyone. Ashley, do you have a rock handy? <laughs> yes, I do. I found them. <laughs> All right, let's see it. Yeah, here's the baby's rock. Oh, that's a nice. nice. Yeah. Very and nice. And then on the back, it says Violetville Rocks. So if you ever see a Violetville Rocks hashtag, that's us. That's really nice. Yeah. And then this is like another one that I have. It says strong. So yeah, people just yeah. put like different messages on there. Courage. Yeah. Yeah. Really. And then where do they put them? Outside, like anywhere. Like they'll hide them on fire hydrants. And so the idea is, is that you find one and then you hide it for somebody else. Or you can keep it if you really like it. That's a great <laughs> idea. That's okay. a fun idea. I think I'm going to steal that from you, Ashley. Yeah, we have a whole Facebook group. It's got like 300 people in there. Like yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It would really be fun to have kind of like a paint your rock day mm -hmm. and then have everybody go out and hide the rocks all over the neighborhood. That'd be fun. Great. Um, Lucia or Ariana, anything you want to add, Lucia? Sure, Lucia, go ahead. Okay, well... We, we had done many things during the pandemia, pandemic. Um, we celebrate as a Latin, the Children's Day, which is the Dia del Niño, that was supposed to be in April. So we didn't want the kids forget about that day. So we did everything on Zoom. Um, we have our uh, page on Facebook. We have almost 3,000 members. So we did challengers like Let's see who can make uh, the most beautiful piñata. Let's see who can do this, who can do that. Then also we celebrate the Father's Day. But uh, my church, Gallery Church in Highland Town, uh, what they did is they did also like a school, like a program of art, which they, they paint, they did a lot of things. And when they finish, they put everything outside. Now something that we are trying to, also in the park, we have uh, Zumba, we have exercise, always keeping our social distancing. But something that I'm so excited is that on September 26th, we, um, we have our caravan festival, which is uh, 
celebration about our culture. We did it last last year. Uh, it was named different. It was a Spanish parade, like in Washington. It was our first time that we, we did that with uh, Nuestras Raices, INC. It's another ONG. So this year, we're going to do caravan. So that means that everybody's going to be in a car. So everything, like each car is going to be from different country, like Peru, Mexico, Colombia, Guatemala, whatever. So we don't want our people to be sad because of this pandemic. So everybody can be outside of their houses with the masks, but nobody can walk with us. It's just the cars. So I'm so excited that my people won't forget this monthly, especially September, October, and November. It's our Spanish um, celebrations. Thank you. Uh, Central Soul is making, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. Central Soul is making um, sessions for mental health for everyone, like for uh, single mothers, for uh, kids, for teens. So we are so happy to help everyone. Thank you. That's good. Um, I work very closely with Central Soul and, and Monica, um, and I know that she's been very focused on uh, the mental health stresses that, that are happening. Um, Ariana, anything you'd like to add? Sure. Yeah, on a hyperlocal level, my block has started a group text where anytime people just want to hang out on their stoops, we do that because it's the safest socially distant thing we can do. Um, and there has been um, prayer walks happening in the community led by Pain Memorial AME Church. So that's another way that people are able to get some connection in um, while still keeping a safe distance. And that definitely has some mental health implications. Um, another piece I wanted to mention, which I think also relates to this question is kind of what happened, what, what came from the, the resources that were, we were sharing during play days. So um, right before COVID hit, we had actually done a big fundraiser and we were planning to have this around the world in a play day, um, like big thing at Utah Marshburn Rec Center for all the kids to really expand their horizons and learn about different places. And absent being able to do that, we realized um, as, as uh, things went on, we started to purchase resources to share with kids who have you know, been really isolated and especially if they have not had the best internet access and they're feeling a lot of that brain drain, getting them both engaged on a creative level, but also more stimulated. So um, one of our neighbors is an artist and activist and has created these really wonderful workbooks that teach kids how to essentially critically think and in, in the lens of their surroundings. Um, so we uh, just purchased a bunch of those and shared and are sharing them out with our residents. So just looking at those different ways that we can, um, you know, help give people ways to, to feel more engaged. And I, I mean, I'm really, that's really wonderful what Lucia was mentioning about mental health. You know, when I find things that are related to, you know, free therapy services and that sort of thing, I'll share them out, but it's really amazing to have a community centered resource like that. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to say also just in general, the, the power of just saying hello on whatever platform and, and finding ways to connect, especially our older residents, they both statistically know more people who have passed or been severely impacted by COVID on a health level and, um, and therefore are also more isolating themselves more. You know, people who I was regularly used to seeing um, in our community just feeling both on a, a mental level and physical concern level, just really hunkered down. So just making sure that we all make those connect connections, whether it's having an email list like some of us run or an individual text or making a call or offering to come by and have a, you know, a wave from afar, all of that just really making a difference as well. Great, thank you. I'm gonna to turn to a couple of the questions we've gotten. Oh, did someone wanna jump in? Yeah, Andy? Dr. Josh, I just also sure. wanted to mention that um, our community for the last few years has, um, has a weekly farmer's market. We are a food desert and we have a weekly farmer's market where community members come and um, are able to purchase fresh fruit, vegetables, 
and um, whatever. And it's another way for us to uh, get a chance to interact and, and speak with each other and be with each other as well. I just wanted to mention that very quickly as well. Great. Oh, I, I thought of something else, sorry. Okay, go ahead. So uh, the other thing that we did too is we created a, well, I created a, a page on the website uh, for addiction and recovery resources because I, I definitely think during this time, like those, uh, that population is very vulnerable with like the stress and trying to stay in recovery. Uh, that is true. And we're seeing that in Baltimore and, and Maryland and around the country. This is a very, very difficult time um, right now when, with respect to substance use. Great. Well, why don't we turn to a couple questions? I'll see whether the people who asked them want maybe to unmute and ask them directly. Miriam, I think I, I see you there. Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Oh, I can't hear you though. I can't, you're muted, even unmuted, I couldn't hear it. Maybe I will ask it. Unless, um, okay. How are communities dealing with childcare? And the, particularly for people who have essential jobs that they can't do at home. So people who have to leave, you know, are, are, what, what are the challenges you're seeing and are your associations in any way involved in trying to be of assistance? Well, I think that one of the things, this is, this is more so from, I guess, my Govins Elementary School hat um, we are finding, as well as the district, the school district is finding that there are a number of children who are being impacted by parents having to work and no one at home to really monitor them uh, and help them do classwork. Uh, there may be an older sibling, but um, not, not very helpful. Um, and one of the things that the district is doing right now is um, creating the, these um, student learning centers for uh, children who may be homeless or children who are the um, who are children of parents who are working, uh, who are have essential jobs. They are they've identified, I think, 15 locations so far. Um, and they are in schools around and recreation centers around the city. I do know that that's one of the initiatives that um, that is in process right now. Um, Govins Elementary School uh, will is actually looking at setting up a, a student learning center um, that would be a little bit independent from the Baltimore City School um, structure, but we are finding that in our school as well, that we, we need to figure out ways that we can um, not so much deal only with childcare, but deal with the academic needs of children who need to have someone to help them along um, with, with their academic studies as well. They need to be monitored. It's an extraordinary it's challenge, particularly for younger kids. Very, right very, now. very hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, Ariana? Yeah, um, going off of what Sandy just said, um, I'll drop it in the chat, especially for the person who asked this question before we wrap up. But um, I saw shared out recently that the city, I don't know if this is the same thing you were saying, uh, Sandy, that I think that the city itself or the school system is creating at least mm -hmm. a thousand slots uh, for, for kids who don't have stable virtual yes. internet learning access. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I recently saw the information about that. So yeah. I'll find it before we go and drop it in there. And sure. I was so excited when I found out about that because um, before I found out that that was a citywide thing happening, I was at one of these kind of building back better meetings and someone was mentioning, you know, we really need to get um, retired teachers, especially in our communities and partner with those and places of worship that are either currently not having services or even if they are during school hours or working hours, you could have these be learning centers like she was talking about. So um, less something that we're doing right now, but something that I think will be coming up um, that, that's in the works. Great. Fantastic. Um, 
Okay, why don't we turn to Olivia, Vera, Olivia? Hey, um, thank you all so much for being here. My question is a little long, so I want to um, try to be mindful of the time. But I think I've experienced that neighborhoods can be um, like a little bit fragmented in Baltimore City. Um, I was a teacher in Brooklyn, um, which is like really far south. Um, there were not a lot of collaborations with nearby neighbors. Um, and I think um, especially given the the legacy of redlining in Baltimore, there are a lot of disparities between neighborhoods and I see a lot of opportunities for neighborhoods to work together to try to overcome those barriers. But I also see that neighborhoods can sometimes be reluctant to work together because it kind of feels like um, there are competing interests or there are conflicts between them. Yeah. Um, and so I'm wondering like at, during and after the pandemic, do you see collaborations between neighborhoods um, that try to try to combat some of those inequities between neighborhoods? Sure. Ashley? Hi. Uh, yeah, so I'm in the same district as Brooklyn, so I totally like understand like how that is. And then like historically, Violetville was, wasn't as diverse as it is now. So that's definitely a conversation that we've had a lot. Like I've had those conversations like on my porch with people, you know, asking things about things that they're seeing in the news or uh, tough questions as far as like race and things. So I think the more that we talk about it, the better it'll be and definitely changing uh, the perception of other communities. So if a community doesn't look like theirs, making sure that they understand that, you know, it's not acceptable to have, like to paint a certain neighborhood a certain way because they look different. Like that's definitely like something that we've been trying to combat. Um, and then I've made it a point to go to those other neighborhoods and collaborate and say like, this is a new Violetville basically. And, you know, once people have those conversations, they realize that they have a lot more in common than they are different. So it's like, I've been telling everybody, like, we're going to get uncomfortable. <laughs> I wonder, thank you. I wonder, Sandy or Ariana, given that your community organizations are bridging in a way different um, communities in Baltimore, uh, how you would respond to Olivia's question. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think I said a little bit earlier um, that the York Road, the York Road community has has been a dividing line uh, between the East and West. And I think one of the signs of hope for our community um, is the fact that we have an umbrella organization that has been evolving over the years. And to come into a York Road partnership meeting, you'll see such incredible diversity. And these are, these are people who are coming from both sides of the corridor, who are working on issues that impact both sides of the corridor. Um, is it, <laughs> Is it, is it a done deal? No, it's not. Um, are there sometimes difficult um, conversations? Um, our conversations, I think someone just said, our, our conversations must be courageous today. We have to address, um, we have to address the racism that is historic. Um, that Homeland and Guilford have been covenant communities. Uh, they intentionally would not um, sell to Jews or to uh, African Americans for many, many years. So this, this is something that we, I think that the entire Black Lives Matter um, has brought this to um, an incredible, um, I guess, point where we can no longer turn a deaf ear, nor can we turn a blind, turn our eyes away from uh, what's been happening. And I think that it challenges our organizations, yes, to, to work across racial boundaries, to work across socioeconomic boundaries. And it's not going to be easy, but it does have to be done. And um, we're very fortunate. I think it with Strong City, we're really taking a, a very strong look 
at racial equity, uh, creating and crafting statements that help us to look at our organization through uh, a racial justice lens. So I am, um, you know, I, I think that that's, I think it's, it's something that we're gonna have to do, Olivia. And uh, I think that there are some of us who are certainly making those efforts. Great, um, Ariana or Lucia, anything you wanna add? Ariana? Um, yeah, so just from what I've been exposed to since COVID, I'd say there's probably five different conversations or collaborations that have come out. And um, the first one was uh, the leader of Memorial Episcopal Church in uh, Bolton Hill, which is the site of where the meeting um, took place that then resulted in Utah Place being codified into law is a historic red line. So that is a, a white church that has some serious uh, reckoning to do and their leadership is very aware of it. And so they had a central West Baltimore dialogue that included a lot of community leaders and organizations to start broaching that topic of anti-racism and racial equity and how what resources do we redistribute and what programs and policies do we create moving forward that truly create more equity uh, in our landscape and in all the services that we provide. So those have been a few conversations that have had, have had um, that have occurred with the with where Madison Park is located, we're one block west into the Utah Place East West kind of divide. And so we both um, in terms of organizations that represent several neighborhoods, we both include neighborhoods that are more to our east with the Midtown Benefits District. So Madison Park is included in that, but it's also included in the No Boundaries Coalition, which is West Baltimore communities. So having that concurrent exposure has enabled me to have conversations kind of in, in both of those groups and try to bridge more of those gaps. So as being the community outreach chair for Madison Park, I'm also on the Midtown Benefits District Board. And I realized that our safety committee um, did not have a chair and so meetings weren't happening. So I restarted that a few weeks ago and reframed the dialogue not around are we making sure that every neighborhood gets security and gets police presence when they want it? But let's start from a place of trust and what are each of our neighborhood associations doing to truly build trust, not just between our neighborhood uh, residents, but also anyone who walks through this neighborhood, what assumptions are our residents making if they don't look like someone who typically historically, you know, has lived in this community and how are we being better and ensuring the safety for everyone, not just our residents, but people who are most vulnerable to being suspected. So nothing is resolved. It's very much in the thick of it, um, but that's kind of, you know, the beginning stages. And then- um, Well, I one question I, I wanted to just jump in with here, because yeah. I think it's partly what Olivia was asking, which is, this is obviously an intense and enduring, you know, challenge and uh, for every Baltimore neighborhood, particularly, I think for, for the areas where, the associations that are literally bridging to um, to uh, very different communities um, because of the history. Has the COVID response made that work easier? Has it made it harder? You know, in some places it is clear that COVID is, you know, deepening divides. And I wonder whether it, it is it just pause that work? You know, how do you think about the response to the pandemic in the in the context of this issue? I think for Violetville, it's made it harder just because people are at home more. And I think that they're tuning into the news more. So a lot of these things are like, I, I think that's where a lot of people are getting their information from because there's things that have been like asked, like people have asked my me to clarify things or, or to explain things because they saw this on the news. See. And so that kind of, Trigger. Our national political dialogue is not exactly conducive to <laughs> working things out all the time, but sorry. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, mm -hmm. but but on next door we have like more, I, I guess, like intense conversations. Mm -hmm. But the ones in person, I think, are the most productive because they're usually with people that I've already built a relationship with. So I kind of explain it. Um, there, there's more empathy there. Like there are more it, when you're typing and you're you're like 
a keyboard warrior or whatever like you could say a lot of stuff but you, like if you're face to face with somebody then it's real and i feel like those have been like the most productive ones i i would say i would say that in, in many ways um i i've i've seen an uptick i, I guess more of a positive response um from many uh people who are not not even from this neighborhood who want to come and volunteer to because we've had many opportunities to volunteer uh, for people to volunteer their services to deliver food to go shopping to pick up medication um we we have found that there have been many people who have come from the west side of York Road to help deliver meals with one of our uh, feeding stations, um, the Italian Cultural Center, be a chef program. Um, there were people who were driving all over, all over this district to deliver food to our seniors. It was phenomenal. And um, I think in that, in that way, the, given the opportunity to go into other areas to to really be a help to other people um i saw i saw things coming together more than i did see things moving apart i think that people were looking really for opportunities to serve and you know and i really want to give a shout out to to the be a chef program because they started off in our neighborhood in fourth fourth and 43rd district serving 100 meals a day. And when we talk about the escalation of the problem in the city, last week, the number of hot meals that were served were over 800. Wow. And that is between March and now. And, and this is the other thing that I want to say too, that there was an incredible influx. And I think that this kind of speaks to what can Baltimore residents do in their own neighborhoods. And I, I really want to say this because um, Monica LaPenta and Francesco Legalupe are preparing 800 meals during a day. And because school has now opened and some stores and shops are open and people are returning back to their jobs now, their volunteer their volunteer teams have really dwindled. So after cooking and preparing 800 meals in a day, Monica and Francesco have to drive and deliver the meals. So I, I really need, I, I just really wanna say that if there, is, if there are people who still want to contribute and help uh, our communities, we need volunteers to continue to, to, to deliver meals to the, for the Be a Chef program. I, I just really needed to get that out because it's great. A, a great opportunity to, uh, to, to share with others as well. Um, I wanna give everyone a chance to add on to that and say if people are listening um, and want to contribute in your area, what, what can they do um, to be be helpful. I don't know, Lucia, if there's anything that you would add to that. Yeah, I think uh, one of the biggest issue that we always having is to have volunteers. That is for true. But it's understandable because most of the people are returning to work. Mm -hmm. So uh, they don't have the same time. But yes, that's, that's the only thing that we need because we already have the help from the city. We have help from um, some grants. And we also received um, some money from people that it's helping Comité Latino de Baltimore. So we, thanks God, we have everything. The only thing that we need is volunteers. So if there is someone that wants to help us, uh, we can share the link. And also I want, I want you to know something. Comité Latino de Baltimore is not helping only uh, Highland Town. He, we do Highland Town. We all, we uh, go to uh, West Side, and also we are giving food to the county. Even though some kind of um, help, it's only for the city, but because we have money from uh, 
on other people, we can do that. So we send more uh, food to the county. So there is many people that are getting food from us. So I think volunteers, please, if there is someone, you can help doing many things. Driving, also helping to carry uh, the boxes and put them on the car. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Ashley or Ariana, anything to add? Yeah, we're always welcoming volunteers, but um, one, of the, one of the things I'd like to do is like challenge other associations to rethink the way that they look at volunteers and attendance and participation. Because I think sometimes it's uh, people measure like how many people are on the Zoom calls and you know how many people are showing up to this. But I think sometimes there's people that want their idea of what volunteering is and participation might be different than what the typical is. So I think really getting to know the residents and then kind of getting a feel of how they'd like to volunteer is really important. Great. Ariana. Yeah, I would, I've already mentioned the great work that No Boundaries Coalition does, but I would recommend looking them up. Um, they do serve specifically West Baltimore, but several communities within it. And whether you're looking for a place to donate, they have several buckets um, and issue areas that they serve or to show up and, you know, do something in person. They have a really strong uh, building civic power element. So they have both a leadership program that their residents actually get uh, stipends to participate in. And they also have uh, door knocking and, you know, that sort of getting the word out about the census and now especially get out the vote. Um, but something going back to kind of the building back better question and connecting it to this, um, they have, there's a, a food market on Pennsylvania Avenue that had to temporarily close down to contain the virus. And so they needed to find a way to still serve their residents fresh foods and they created a bulk buying program. So that's now something that it is coming out as a product of this time as they still reopen that market. Um, so that's another thing that donating would go to. And um, more citywide organizations are So What Else and Mom Cares. Um, Mom Cares actually provides support to mothers who've had traumatic pregnancies, um, but they've also been doing a lot of food and toiletry distribution, and they're always looking for drivers and people to hand things out, and same with So What Else. Great. Well, th thank you so much. This has been such an inspirational talk, really, to hear from you all um, and the work that you're doing um, and continue to do at this just incredibly uh, challenging moment. This is really, you know, a public health crisis that hasn't been matched in the city in a hundred years um, uh, in terms of the, the, uh, an infectious disease threat at least. And um, it's really remarkable to, to hear these stories. This is really part of the, I think the untold story of why uh, Baltimore has done relatively better than a lot of other places is because of the work um, of you all and, and, and people um, in your organization. So I really wanna express my appreciation. I'm gonna turn things back over to Mike, and maybe Mike, you could, before you wrap up, say a little something about Strong City Baltimore and the role that Strong City can play for people who are interested in getting involved in this kind of work in their own communities. <clears throat> sure, thanks for that, Josh. Um, yeah, well, I first, I, I just wanna say, um, this has really been an inspiring uh, experience. I, I, I set aside a little more than an hour for this talk, an hour and 15 minutes, and I, and I feel like um, we could actually talk about this stuff for, for two or three hours and not, and not get tired of it, at least I could. Um, but I do wanna respect people's time. Um, yeah, thanks for that. So, so for those who don't know, Strong City has been um, a nonprofit in Baltimore for 51 years. Um, our mission is building and strengthening neighborhoods and people. And um, the main way in which we've done that historically has been by supporting neighborhood leaders who are strengthening their communities, ju just as we're, we're doing that in a way. Today, we've done it uh, in many ways through direct uh, organizing work in communities uh, by fiscally sponsoring, uh, organ many organizations and, and helping a lot of them kind of get started and get going. Um, and we've also, um, you know, provided, we, we have an array of programs and services, including an adult literacy center, 
and um, a uh, uh, an after school program in East Baltimore and uh, a recreation center um, in uh, the Abel neighborhood. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's we have various opportunities for getting involved. Um, you can reach out to me. Um, I, I'll put my my information in the chat. Uh, you know, feel free to reach out anytime. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, we, we, we do utilize volunteers, especially at our, our, our uh, adult learning center, but in other ways from time to time. Um, and, oh, and I just want to give a chance to see if Mr. Davis wants to jump in anything he wants uh, to so add. So Reggie, Reggie had to leave, uh, but he, he, oh, he's he back. I think I see him right there. Oh, I'm, I'm still here. Uh, oh. uh, you know, the only, what I would just add, I think, when we, we on the strong city side were having discussions around the neighborhood series, we knew that this was a pressing issue today. And then we also knew that we needed to be thinking about what happens after the pandemic. And so what does the needs of community, uh, really identify the needs of community. And that as we, as the city plots out what the future looks like at the center of that has to be community and community leadership. And so that has been our perspective. The other thing that I would just offer up in addition to what Mike has said is that, um, you know, we have, you know, our network of fiscal sponsor organizations, many of whom are doing work uh, day and night to respond to the particular needs around COVID-19 and, and, and raising up issues that we um, may not have been aware of or that we are aware of. And so to be able to access that group of individuals we certainly can do um, because there's a lot of great work that's happening around the city um, that we wanna be able to elevate and also use our voice um, however we can to talk about this important issue. Great, fantastic. Mike, Thanks. back to you, any last words? Um, so the last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, we, uh, so we're doing things to, to, to try to sort of make up for the fact we didn't have Neighborhood Institute this year, but we, we, we are gonna have Neighborhood Institute next year. We're, we're really, we're gonna do it one way or another. Uh, don't know 100% what it's gonna look like, but um, yeah, we have a, a target date of April 24th. That's Saturday, April 24th, uh, 2021. So uh, save the date. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna try to get back to because we, we need to do it. You know, I mean, I think the, the last hour and 15 minutes have shown me or reminded me that you know we need a lot more of these conversations. I mean, this was was a fantastic start uh, at having the kind of, of discussions that we need to have about what's going on in neighborhoods, and that's what that's what Neighborhood Institute is. So uh, we're gonna do it. Um, get it on your calendar. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Sandy for mentioning the fact that uh, Strong City has recently published a book um, about all of this stuff. And um, I'm going to just take a quick moment here and show you. I think uh, Reggie is already doing that for you. Oh. Oh, yeah. and Sandy also. <laughs> <That's> pretty, <yeah. laughs> Everyone wants to show the book. So thank We're you. Strong for City Strong. <laughs> The book is called Building Blocks, Stories of Neighborhood Transformation from Strong City, Baltimore. It's available on our website, strongcitybaltimore.org. Um, lots of great information there about uh, our programs and, and, and all these other things that are going on. So this was the first of our Strong City Neighborhood Conversations and there will be more. Uh, check our Facebook page, check our, uh, our weekly newsletter uh, reach out to me personally for for information, but we'll we'll be doing more of these, and we hope we hope you all come back. And we really appreciate everyone being here today. And thank you to our Josh, and thank you to our panelists. We really appreciate yes. your insight. Yes, yeah, thank you for having us. Wonderful panel. Everyone's going to get a copy of the book. <laughs> Wish I could give you more than that, but that's uh, that's what we got. But that's we 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 uh, we deeply appreciate people. Um, volunteering their time to do things like this we really do yeah maybe we could trade i can give you a copy of the violetville book <laughs> are we allowed to sneak into violetville and put rocks down yeah yeah oh my gosh everybody would freak out they'd love it <laughs> especially if you hashtag it like who it's from like strong city baltimore or something. <laughs>
All right, sounds good. Good to see everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate all of you. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if we got to answer your question, Kim. Um, oh, there are many. It's Kimberly, by the Kimberly. way. Kimberly Maria. My la mother's last name is Kim. Her last, her, she's half, I'm half Korean, so I'm very particular about my namesake. It's all. Oh, gotcha. But yes, I, ha I do own that book. Wonderful. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coordinating all of this. Great. Thanks for being here. These are my, this is my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving. Here we all are in each other's bedrooms. Yeah. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>